Fortunately, even with a microphone, sometimes masks make you mumble or sound like you are mumbling. So, at any rate, good morning. So, how many of you are Marines? None of, none of you are Marines. Well, I just want to say today, you are the few and the proud. So, uh, we're, we're awfully glad to see you. And I'm glad to be here. Uh, did not, in the end, have COVID. And um, according to the test I took, uh, certainly felt like I was having another round with it, but uh, no. So, uh, anyway, I appreciate all your prayers and uh, I'm doing much better myself. And hopefully... Uh, All of you are still doing very well. Would invite you to take a look at your bulletin and those who are lifted up in the prayer concerns. Uh, My sister Robbie and her neighbor Sarah, uh, Eleanor Irway's son, uh, who has uh, uh, just continued to lift up his eye situation, Uh, family of uh, my friend Dave Thomas. Certainly ask you to keep Glenn and, uh, and our neighbor Lee Ward Steve Georgia. Uh, Steve is going to be coming home soon. Uh, Unfortunately, they feel, uh, and you could say, fortunately, they feel like he's ready to come home. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that that's the case, and you know how that works with insurance and all those kind of things. So ask for uh, prayers for Steve and for Sue as uh, as he gets home later this week, um, unless there's a reprieve from the governor. Uh, kind of thing uh, in terms of the insurance and uh, and I would invite you to pray for that to occur uh, so let's again keep Steve in our prayers um, Ellie Hiles friend Travis uh, Jackie Hawkins brother and Linda Kurtz grandson uh, and Linda says that uh, he is progressing and there's some hope he's going to be home soon uh, if things continue to go uh, the direction they're going is certainly not done with treatment yet or anything like that, and uh, definitely very much still in need of prayer. So uh, let's keep him in our prayers. And yes, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and Gene Hawkins uh, is now suffering from COVID, so that's why they aren't here this morning. So uh, prayers for Gene as well, if you would. Are there others that you'd like to lift up at this time? All right. Uh, a praise for the day. You may have noticed, it, it, you know, in the midwinter, mid-winter uh, lull and fade that, you know, strikes all of us so dramatically, you might not, but we have Brenda at the piano today. Praise God. Yeah, we, we, could, we could do the doxology now, couldn't we? <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And I don't do that as a joke. I I really am. And and it's not just for you, Brenda. We're thankful for everyone who is here today and in this bitter cold and uh, and in the situation that confronts us. uh, We are thankful to see one another, aren't we? And it is praiseworthy, to be sure. Well, if there are no other uh, uh, announcements to make... Oh, also, uh, Thursday night at 7, we will be having a... uh, Staff Parish Relations Committee meeting, and that will be via Zoom. That's my plan at this point, okay? Um, So I would invite you to sit back and to allow Brenda to lead us into worship with music and, uh, and enjoy it.
Thank you, Brenda. Would you please rise for our opening prayer? <clears throat> and join me in the prayer. Everlasting God, you have revealed yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and ever live and reign in the perfect unity of love. Grant that we will always hold firmly and joyfully to this faith and living in praise of your divine majesty may finally be one in you who are three persons in one God forever and ever. Amen. Our opening song uh, hymn is uh, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. It's an in your hymnal on page 420. Seated. Please be in an attitude of prayer. Good morning, Father God. Good morning, Lord Jesus. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Three in one, a mystery we can't fully wrap our minds around. Eternal life another mystery that we can't quite unwrap and fully comprehend. The massiveness of endless space boggles our understanding, yet we know in our heart it's true. You are God with a capital G who loves us and wants us wants to be in an intimate relationship with us. Hard to comprehend, but we too, we know this too is true. You are God and you want to uh, give us wonderful gifts we can't earn, free gifts we don't deserve, and yet we know your generosity is real. Salvation forgiveness of sins, a personal, eternal relationship with you, and there are more, utterances of wisdom, utterances of knowledge, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning spirits, tongues, interpretations of tongues, visions, dreams, 
the ability to interpret dreams, worship, power, rushing winds and tongues of fire, faith, hope, and love. And there are more gifts, endless gifts, that we can't begin to fully embrace this side of heaven. Yet we know they are real, and we invite you to enter into us today with your spirit and transform us into your likeness. Come, Holy Spirit, descend upon us this morning, filling us with the gifts we need to bring uh, we need to bring glory and honor to your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I realize that we have no uh, children here this morning in the service. I'm kind of assuming there may be some kids at home watching. But even if it, that is not the case, um, I think that this is a message that I would definitely hand off to you all because how many of you still occasionally wake up in the middle of the night having had a bad dream? And, and how many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but how many of you sometimes wake up almost terrified from that bad dream? You know, that still happens. So boys and girls, if you're watching, know that uh, the th same thing happens to adults. So I thought, since we're talking about the Holy Spirit, I would give you something to uh, help you on that road back to feeling okay when you wake up in the middle of the night and, uh, and you have had a nightmare. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. One of the things that happens when we wake up in the middle of the night, we are fearful because we cannot see. Why can't we see? It's dark, yeah. And so uh, we, we don't uh, have a light right in front of us. I mean, we re can reach over and turn the light on, and that helps, doesn't it? I was thinking about setting up a, a thing back here, but I thought I couldn't get it dark enough to really make it, you know, feel that way, of a coat, ha a coat rack with, you know, with a coat and a hat, and, and, and uh, like when I was a little kid, I used to wake up and my, my little clothes rack was sitting there, and, and I knew it was my clothes rack, I knew, I knew what everything on it was, but it looked like a monster to me. Anyway, so, um, you know, we can't see. Well, we can turn the light on, and, and that helps, because we can see everything, but then do we want to turn the light back off? Because we still feel kind of scared inside, don't we? Well, one of the things that I want, to, I want to say to you today is that God understands that, and that is one reason why he sent us the Holy Spirit. And we're told that the Holy Spirit is God present with us. Now, boys and girls, that means that God is actually with you, working in you at all times, okay, in Jesus. So we are, we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit in us, and, and so he is there for guidance, okay, for comfort, and for strength. Now, have you ever awakened in the middle of the night, and adults, you might be in the same position, you might remember this, and cried out for your mom or your dad? And they come, or if you are an parent, uh, you went, and what did you go for? To comfort them. You want to be comforted when you're afraid. You want someone to give you a hug, 
Kathy, come here. We didn't practice this. And, and, and you would like them to come and say, it's okay. It's okay, darling. Help me. We didn't have to practice because this happens all the time. Anyway. <laughs> Only it's usually me crying. Anyway. <laughs> now, for comfort, we want to be comforted. And then, you know, that's kind of like turning the light on, isn't it? It comforts you, makes you feel better. But then we want strength to hang on to that comfort feeling. And, uh, and so the, the Holy Spirit is there for the whole thing, for guidance, to help us know enough to turn the light on maybe, for comfort, to let us know that he is with us and he cares, and for strength to see us through the fear and back into sleep and rest again. So I have a prayer here, and we'll get it in the next newsletter. And uh, this is a prayer that would be good to keep handy. And even if you're not a child, even if you're a teenager, you might like this prayer. If you're an adult, you might like it for yourself. And you might also like it when you are caring for your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren, all right? So I'm going to invite you to pray it with me now. We'll get it in the next newsletter, okay? So let's bow our heads together and pray. Lord Jesus, I trust you for what I can't see. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, fill me with your light, which protects me from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. As we move into a time of uh, offering, uh, again, as always, the, the uh, offering plates are in the back. Uh, offering envelopes are in the back on the table and available for you to pick up, too. But uh, we'll do that at the end of the service in terms of your ability to drop it in. Unless you really want to, you're welcome to get up right now and go back and put your offering in there. But I would really like for you to take some time, as we have done for some time now, take this offering time to recommit yourself to the Lord. Consider what it is that God is calling on you to give of yourself, because that's the greatest part of the, our tithes and our gifts and our offerings. If our hearts are given to God, our finances will be. And uh, if our hearts are given to God, our actions will be. So I'd ask you to spend some time in prayer, and you're going to have, the uh, again, the wonderful joy of Brenda's accompaniment to, uh, to lead you into and through that time, which will be punctuated, again, wonderfully, by a prayer of dedication by Ed. So uh, I invite you now to, to bow your heads, and let's spend some time with the Lord in and, uh, and really give ourselves to him anew.
Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to take the gifts that we put in the offering plate and the gifts that are us, the gifts that you have given us. Lord, we ask that you do that with them as Jesus did when he fed the 5,000. He started with a little boy's lunch, fed 5,000 men plus women and children, and had more left over than he started with. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And our next uh, hymn is, uh, I am so glad Jesus lifted me. It would be found in the Faith We Sing book uh, on page 2151, if you're looking it up. Just before Ed starts, I, you, you can be seated, but I just wanted to say, what a blessing. Thank you. <laughs> we, it was funny this morning at the early service, we, we had the, the uh, uh, music that you know, has been pulled off the internet, and, um, and I felt like I was at a, a, a very small Sunday school gathering singing that song. <laughs> and it, was, it just was, trust me, you got the better end of that one, folks. <laughs> Our scripture reading this morning comes from uh, Genesis chapter 41, verses 38 to 42. Pardon me for holding the Bible so close, but the print is very small. Uh, and Pharaoh said to his servants, uh, can we find such a man as this in whom the Spirit of God is the Spirit of God. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, uh, since God has shown you all of this, there is none so discreet and wise as you are. Uh, you shall uh, be over my house and all of my people uh, shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh uh, said to Joseph, Behold, I have set you over the land of Egypt. The word of God for, for the people of God. Thank you, Ed. One of the things I wanted to get uh, you started in your thinking last week and to continue to encourage your thinking this week is the continuity of the work of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, between the two segments of the Bible that we know as the Old and the New Testament. The breakover occurs, of course, with the birth, teaching, atoning death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, kind of really between those two things, in a sense. In truth, you wouldn't be far off the mark to consider the Gospels as a buffer between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, 
the ultimate break point really being the resurrection. That's when everything that was from before ended and everything that would be started. Up until the resurrection, even the Gospels are ultimately the culmination of the Old Testament. They are the story of the end of the initial creation of God's plan of salvation, culminated in the resurrection as the new day dawning of a new world, a new kingdom, emphasized shortly thereafter by the moment of Pentecost, when the new kingdom created is then empowered to be. And not just to exist, but to grow and reach out to all people in the world who would receive it. It's that moment when the private company, if you will, of Judaism suddenly goes public and changes everything. That being said, and the Holy Spirit's presence and total involvement being brought to the forefront, I think it's really important for us to see uh, the continuity, as I've said, between the Old Testament and the New Testament and the Holy Spirit's work therein. However, there are also considerable differences. As good theologians, which you are, and I don't say that with a chuckle or with a grin or anything else, you are theologians. You, you do have thoughts and understandings of who, what, and how God is, and that's what theology really is about. So in point of fact, yes, you are theologians, and I did not say that as a joke. So, as good theologians, you know that the Holy Spirit is to be a normative part of Christian life. We are to be filled with the Spirit. God promises us that intensity of relationship with him. Jesus himself promised us a comforter even the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a, and, and, you know, you talk about the Holy Spirit being there for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. Jesus used the word comfortor, and isn't it a, a really tender and, uh, and exciting thought that God is the comforter? The Holy Spirit. We are promised that God with us experience that we long for and that we need so desperately if we are to truly grow in our Christian lives. Again, the Holy Spirit is to be normative, reflective of the assumption of such a norm or favoring its establishment. That was a dictionary definition in case you were wondering if I was going nuts. Anyway, God favors its establishment. I'm assuming that you all remember the story of Pentecost enough to recognize that at that moment, we're not told that anyone was praying for the Holy Spirit to come. They didn't have a clue what was going to happen. The very change in the world. They had some vague understanding of the Holy Spirit. Certainly God's Spirit has been mentioned time and again in the Old Testament. And many of them would have had a memory of that at some level, but they weren't praying for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. They were just all in one place worshiping God. It would be safe to say that they were Christians. They were certainly followers of Jesus Christ. This is after his resurrection and his ascension. They were people who believed as much as they understood about him, his atoning death and their salvation, and the promise of their own resurrection from the dead in a day which had not yet come. Because they were still alive. But they were not empowered from a number of perspectives. We'll address this in much more detail when we, uh, when we begin to move ahead a little and get into the New Testament sense of the Holy Spirit and Christianity. And all of us who have followed at a later date. But with that preface, let's go back again then to the Old Testament story of Joseph and the Holy Spirit in his life. Because it serves as a wonderful example of how God worked in the reality of the Old Testament times and gives us some clear indications of what God would like to do in your life today. Joseph was special from the get-go. 
that was recognized by everybody who knew him. In his father's eyes, that is Jacob, Joseph's specialness was viewed positively. He was a wonderful, he was the son that every father could be proud of, smarter than the rest, better looking than the rest, and better than the rest. In the eyes of the others, that wasn't necessarily such a positive thing. We know that Joseph's brothers were not all that crazy about him, at least, uh, you know, most of them weren't. I don't think any of them were, with the possible exception of Benjamin. But some of them were more restrained in their reaction to their unhappiness than there were others who were very unrestrained. And we know that they viewed his specialness with jealousy and even hatred. In God's eyes and in God's plan, that specialness was a combination of the amazing human nature of Joseph, which was indeed amazing, and he really was remarkable. He was smart, he was good-looking, with a commitment to God that shows up clearly time and time again. And also God looked at his specialness, recognizing his own incredible ability, that is God's ability, to change, plan, and to use Joseph to live out and reveal his perfect will. So God gives Joseph dreams and blessings. And then in due time, he moves him away from home and family. Uh, it wasn't a very pleasant uh, move, by the way. He was led off in chains into captivity as a slave after his brothers sold him into slavery. But he gets him away from home and family. And he goes through a process which eventually leads to Joseph being reunited with his brothers and the proof of the pudding that Joseph was this special guy who God could use and could include in his plans. And Joseph reveals that by saying to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. I hold nothing against you. Now there aren't many, there are people who might be able to submit to God, but could you resubmit to brothers who sold you into slavery? Joseph was a special guy. He had a unique perspective on his own life that grew throughout his own life. So that even Joseph recognized that his life was totally in God's hands, and that life was a roller coaster of highs and lows, precisely organized and established by God so that Joseph was exactly where he needed to be when he needed to be there, with exactly what he needed to know when he needed to know it, and precisely able to say what he needed to say when he needed to say it. And, this is the really remarkable part, because we know God can do all that, but he also had the patience, and that's the incredible part, to maintain his faith in circumstances and situations that would drive most of us out of our minds, literally, if not figuratively. Faith that was his until finally he is taken from the literal prison that he has been in for years, unjustly, by the way, and cleaned up, presented to Pharaoh, and in the process of fulfilling Pharaoh's wishes, and it was a very short process, Pharaoh is so clearly impressed by this remarkable young man, or middle-aged man, I don't know how old Joseph was at that point, he'd been around a while, but Pharaoh recognizes the truth of what Joseph says in regards to Pharaoh's own dreams. Do you remember that story? Pharaoh had his dream interpreters gathered together, and he said, uh, this, this is a really important dream, so here's the deal. So I know that you're telling me the truth. You're going to have to tell me the dream and the interpretation. And, and they were like, well, tell us the dream. And well, no, 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 you don't understand. You have to tell me what I dreamed and the interpretation. 
And they couldn't do it. It was impossible for them, as it would be impossible for anybody. As in point of fact, it would have been impossible for Joseph, except for the fact that he was not just Joseph. And what is recognized by Pharaoh is something that we ought to be recognized for as well in our own lives. When Pharaoh says, can we find anyone else like this, one in whom is the Spirit of God? That's how Joseph succeeded. He was a remarkable guy in his own human condition, but without the Holy Spirit, without God's Spirit at work in him, not so much. But because of the Holy Spirit, there was nothing he couldn't do. He, he knew what the dream was. He told, actually it was a couple dreams, he told the Pharaoh what his dreams were, what they meant, and uh, Pharaoh was so astounded that something truly remarkable happened. He recognized the truth of what was going on in Joseph. Now Pharaoh was considered by the people and by himself to be a god, small g. But because of the word of Joseph's testimony, he immediately recognizes the superiority of Joseph's God, capital G, and in the next instant does something which is probably rather unique in all of human history. I, I'm not aware of any other time that anything remotely like this really has happened. In an instant, he makes a decision to submit all of Egypt to Joseph's authority and wisdom, accounting that decision to be the acknowledgement and the authority of the wisdom of God. So here's Joseph one day in prison, languishing, but not giving up. I'm not saying it wasn't hard. I'm not saying he wasn't disgusted or disappointed, but not giving up. And all of a sudden, he's dragged out of the prison, probably run through a shower, I would guess, having been in the prison. It probably wasn't uh, all that pleasant a place. And the next thing you know, he's in front of Pharaoh, and he takes a little time and prays, and, uh, and he gives Pharaoh the answer. And then Pharaoh says, oh, good, all right, so you obviously are, are so under the spirit of God. Mind you, I'm a God, but obviously this one's superior, okay? He says, so, you know, uh, we, need to, we need to prepare for these the seven years of famine as we have the seven years, good years that are coming. And there's nobody in the kingdom who compares to you, Joseph. I've only known you. A couple hours <clears throat> but nobody compares to you why don't you why don't you take over the kingdom mind you I'm gonna stay on the throne but you can take over the kingdom is that the most bizarre thing you ever heard what's the difference the difference was he recognized that part of Joseph that wasn't Joseph he recognized that it was the Spirit of God Throughout the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit shows up in individuals, people like prophets, to be sure, a few of the good kings, but they were mighty few. But it is in Joseph that we get the, perhaps the clearest inkling of what the Holy Spirit is going to be someday from then in the life of every Christian who would be coming a long time in the future. I think Joseph is probably the best Old Testament example of someone who is under the influence of the Holy Spirit that we have in all the Bible. The truth is that uh, that someday has come to pass. That someday when the Holy Spirit would be available to every person who would receive it is now. You are the people that Joseph is foreshadowing in the Old Testament. You are the Josephs of today. You know, 
would, would you like to stand in front of the Pharaoh and have him give you control? I wouldn't want to, honestly. I wouldn't want that responsibility on myself. But would you like to have that much of a presence and a relationship with the Holy Spirit in your life so that others would see it that clearly? And what God says is, this is my desire for you. How do you think Joseph got through the unjust treatment of his brothers? How do you think he got through the incredible injustice of being sold into slavery? How do you think he got through the incredible injustice of the accusations of Potiphar's wife when the exact opposite was true? How do you think he got through the misery and wretchedness of being thrown into prison? How do you think he got through the seeming forgetfulness of the servants of the king whom he had helped? If you don't know that story, pop back and uh, go back a few chapters from uh, chapter 41 and read it, because it's pretty amazing. It was the presence of God with him in the Holy Spirit, and it was so profoundly clear that everyone recognized it, even the Pharaoh. Joseph reveals its source to the Pharaoh, says it is God, and he doesn't claim any responsibility for or credit for the interpretive power that he demonstrates relative to Pharaoh's dreams, which he not only interpreted, as I said, but actually explained to Pharaoh without ever having heard the dream from Pharaoh's mouth. And then he gives credit exclusively for that to God. Again, this is the reality of the Holy Spirit in the life of the, be- of the believer. We may not go through exactly what Joseph did. Our lows are probably nowhere near as low as his. Our highs are probably nowhere near as high in the eyes of the world. But they are every bit as high in the eyes of God. If we're followers of Jesus Christ, our lives have exactly the same purpose that Joseph had, which is to serve the Lord to introduce people to a Savior who loves them. Egypt was saved from starvation, and many other peoples around them were saved from starvation. The whole Jewish Hebrew population, which was yet to come, was saved from starvation and destruction by God's revelation through Joseph, at least for a time. Is the Holy Spirit speaking deliverance and love through your words and your life to someone today? Because that's that's your purpose. You know, you, uh, you may think my purpose is this or my purpose is that. You may see your purpose as your job. You may see your purpose as your children, raising them and getting them through college and all those things. You may see your purpose in one of any number of directions but the truth is as a Christian we have one purpose that's it and uh, and as I said Joseph is the prime example for us and back in the Old Testament we get an inkling of what it is to have the presence of the Holy Spirit in us to the extent that it can be seen and minister to the lives of those around us. Well, I'm going to be talking about the Holy Spirit for a while yet. I don't know how long, probably a long time. It may may be the last sermon I ever preach in this church will still be about the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to promise you anything either way. So, having said that, I would very much appreciate any input that you would have for me in terms of questions or things that you would particularly like me to address. My intention is to to spend quite a few Sundays on this. And then I would really like to get together and do a a spiritual inventory with y'all. And we're going to do that Uh, in a service because that way we can all get it done and I want you to know
what your spiritual giftedness is. I want you to have a sense of it because um, there's going to be a change in the church and there's going to be someone new coming in. And I would like very much, with all my heart, to have you go into that change with a security in your heart, knowing that God has a place for you in this church and that God has a purpose for your life and is not just willing to direct from afar through the Holy Spirit to direct you from within. That is my goal. That is my purpose. That's why I've been here for the years that I've been here. And, uh, and so that's kind of one of the things that I feel like God is just really bringing home to me in these days. So I, uh, will add, I intend to end every service with at least a gap to offer you the opportunity if you have any questions that you would like to see addressed in this or if you have any questions from today's message or yesterday or, or rather last week or the week before. Um, if you have anything you want to share with me right now, it, or you can obviously call me or, or you can pop it on to the Facebook line or you can contact me uh, directly however is comfortable for you. All right, seeing nothing now, hopefully I will, I will, I will pick at it until it itches and uh, you will, uh, you know, you, you will have some things. Um, if you have a question, I guarantee there's at least somebody else who does and I may not be able to answer it right off, but we'll explore it together as we consider the work of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ in each of you. Amen. I would invite you to stand and uh, let us sing together, Shine, Jesus, Shine. You'll find that uh, on the screen and in your uh, The Faith We Sing books on page 2173.
were paying attention to the words, um, they really directed us exactly what, to what we're talking about today. You know, let your likeness be reflected in me. It was so clear in Joseph that even Pharaoh couldn't miss it. And it is my prayer for you that as you go forth in this day, that the presence of the Holy Spirit at work within you would be so clear that people couldn't miss it. That they would indeed recognize God at work in you and so be turned to him themselves. May it be so in your life. Amen.